Um, hello again. Um, so this morning you heard from the fire starters. This afternoon you tended to those fires. And now we're going to have a fireside chat. We're going to have a slide of a little fireplace back there, but um, I think maybe we're not going to do that. Instead, um, I'm going to introduce uh, our special guests. We're delighted to be joined by the two of the nation's leading voices on race and equality and racial and ethnic politics, among other important topics. Uh, Dr. Philip Goff is an associate professor of social psychology at the University of California, Los Angeles, currently on leave as a visiting scholar at the Harvard Kennedy School. And he is co-founder and president of the Center for Policing Equity and an expert in contemporary forms of racial bias and discrimination, as well as the intersections of race and gender. Um, there's lots of other things on your uh, bio, Phil. I'm not going to read them all, but suffice it to say, he's, he's very brilliant and, and you're going to be um, blessed with his insights. Um, Dorian Warren is a fellow at the Roosevelt Institute and MSNBC contributor and board chair of the Center for Community Change. Um, he's a scholar of inequality and American politics. His research and teaching interests include labor organizing, politics and policy, race and ethnic politics, African-American politics, um, urban politics and policy. Wow, there are a lot of things here, Dorian. Um, and um, <laughs> Dorian has worked with a host of national and local organizations, and uh, I'll just take a minute to um, note that uh, one of those organizations is the Leadership Conference. Um, and I'm pleased to say Dorian is a product of our intern program many, many years ago. And so, and look. Yes, here he is today. So, you know, it is the circle of life. Um, so, uh, okay, so we've asked Phil and Dorian to pretend that there aren't 100 people who are sitting there watching them. They are friends and colleagues, and, and we want them to have a chat about um, the following weighty issues. Um, Dorian is, um, has been asked to help, help provide a big picture context for all the things that we're talking to, the systemic failures that have come up time and time again in the course of the day. Um, and um, Phil um, is going to um, help contribute to this conversation by talking about the role that data plays in knowing more about who we are and what is going on in the field. And then um, we're gonna have time for Q&A. So, um, uh, so get your questions ready, but with that, please take it away. Thank you. Well, since, hey, everybody. Hey. Hey, everybody. Hey. Okay, a little more energy. I know it's the end of the day. And uh, so I, I came in a little late, so actually maybe I can start the conversation by asking Phil, what worried you the most about what you've heard today? And then I'll jump in with some thoughts. Uh, what worries me the most about what I hear today, um, what I've heard today, there is a massive gap between um, the data scientists and technologists and the people whose principal concern is the welfare of communities that are vulnerable to, to state abuse. Um, and it's a gap in uh, sort of, it's a capacity gap, it's a knowledge gap, and it's an access gap um, in, in ways that it was, it's difficult to see where the systemic solutions to bridge those gaps are gonna come from. But it's absolutely, it, it's, it's more crucial to me having sat through a couple hours in our, our session, so having sat through the, the Firestarter uh, presentations, it's more crucial to me that we figure out a way to give these same tools to the communities whose job it has to be to hold the state accountable. So uh, as I was thinking about today, I, I tend to start from the assumption that all technology is neutral but then it gets inflicted, inflected rather with existing patterns of inequality, with politics, and can be used in good or bad ways. And so I was trying to think through, and maybe this is a question I'll pose not only to you, but to, to the audience, it's a question I pose to myself. In this moment of incredible sophistication, incredible innovation, was there a discussion, I'm just curious, was there a discussion today about what are the ethical principles underlying the use of data? And, and are we, do we have consensus on those ethical principles, right? Do we have a consensus on who gets access to data? What data is collected? 
is it publicly available? And, and I come at this, I to say my bias is from the employment realm where we see all the time the use of data for background checks, the scarring of social media for job applicants, credit checks, there are a range of ways in which data is used in that context. And God forbid if you're formally incarcerated and there's it, right? So there, there are all these layers in which data is used in employment to exclude people in a way that's not geared towards equitable outcomes. So I'm just, I'm just curious about the broad, broader issue of consensus around a set of ethical principles for how we use data, whether it's in policing or other realms of society. Yeah, I think I can safely say we didn't come anywhere close to a consensus during the course of the day. I was only in one room, but there were about 12 different consensuses between six different people at one point in time. Um, so we're no, we're, we're nowhere near getting uh, close to a consensus. Um, I think that it's, it's important, we didn't talk about this, at least in, in my session, all that much, but I think it's, it's an undercurrent of all of the sessions and in all of the feedback that I got while I was stealing brownies in between, um, <clears throat> which is that this is, a, a, in some fundamental ways, um, a kind of power analysis. Mm. This is a kind of, forgive me, political science, in the sense that data in the, in the information age is always a tool for powerful classes of people to collect information to solve problems that are their problems. And if we don't have open access data and we don't have um, sort of tools to give not only the data away, but the analytic tools, then it stays that way. So part of what, what I know has been a concern for me and was concern in our room and in the several folks I got a chance to talk to about this is we talk about data in policing a lot because the data are terrible. Mm. And they're terrible for lots and lots of different reasons. Hashtag justice database. Um, <clears throat> but <clears throat> but what, we're, what we're starting to need to talk about as states like California are, are passing statewide laws that say not only are you gonna have to start tracking use of force, but you're gonna start collecting it in standardized ways and reporting it up, we're gonna start publishing it for you. Data are themselves inert. That means they are useless without an analytic strategy. And if you haven't articulated the analytic strategy and the values that undergird it, it's just like a budget. A budget just seems like numbers. It's actually a moral document. Analytic strategies are moral documents to, to answer values-based questions. So if we don't create a democracy around the people who are empowered to ask the questions, then we're gonna have data that feels on its face technologically neutral. Right? But that ends up reinscribing systems of power in ways that are way harder, way more entrenched, and way harder, therefore, to sort of cast off and, and, and resist. Well, you're collecting data, right? Well, yeah. So how do we hold you accountable? Well, so... <laughs> um, <clears throat> The, the, the comment that I, I'm giving here and the comment that I gave as, as the last comment that, that I gave to the, the session is we need broader diversity in the people who have data, have, are developing an analytic strategies, um, and can demand it, mm -hmm. right? So we're held accountable. The, the Center for Policing Equity is uh, engaged in a project called the National Justice Database. We're collecting nationally representative uh, data. We hope it'll be representative, but national level data on police behavior. That includes stops and use of force, along with arrest data, and we're integrating that with data on education, employment, housing, healthcare, um, mental health, the, the voting, the things that we can integrate it with. Um, the way you hold that accountable is we have a way to give those data away. We have a way to make that accessible to other researchers, right? So open access is not always something that's feasible. We couldn't go to, at the time when we started doing this was before Trayvon, Mar Trayvon Martin was murdered. Like, we, we didn't have the option of saying, hey, give away your data, because it's going to be forced on you by events in the media very soon. We didn't know. Um, but what we can do is we can, we can find ways to keep individual departments from being identified, and yet at the same time allow researchers who are not us, who have different research agendas, to get available to it. And we're applying for monies right now to create little workshop boot camps for people in high school and college who really want to learn how to do this stuff and who have questions to learn how to d develop those questions into basically algorithms and math and statistics that they can then get access to the data and they can ask them, them themselves. But the only way to, to make sure there's accountability is to make sure that there's representativeness in the people asking the questions. So you just said a lot there. There's a lot. Because um, I, I was thinking about algorithms and I don't, I don't know much about algorithms because I'm more of a qualitative researcher, Alondra, but 
I was just thinking about algorithms and and the promise, right, of, right, I know what it is, and the promise of using algorithms, again, I know it more in a consumer behavior context and a political context, right, of being able to do predictive modeling, right, around voting behavior, for instance. And then, of course, I know in my hometown, and I know there's some people here that are d developing this and innovating around this, there's predictive policing, right, so there's certain algorithms used for that. Um, so I was thinking, okay, so, there's predictive policing in the sense of trying to predict crimes in certain neighborhoods and blocks and areas and hotspots. There's there are algorithms used to predict a range of consumer behavior. But again, from where I come from in the employment context, those algorithms are often used in service of discrimination. And so the question that arises for me is, if I'm, say, discriminated against based on an algorithm, do I sue the algorithm? I, what, I, there seems to me to be some huge regulatory gaps between what I think you've talked about today and how we regulate and monitor the use of all of this data. And so as the expert who's collecting this national data, and you've thought a lot about this, I'm wondering from you if you've thought also about how to fill in those regulatory gaps. This is partly why I was curious just about how we hold you accountable in a sense, half joking. But what are the what are the... How do we fill in those regulatory gaps when, especially when the courts, for instance, in a discrimination context, say you have to show intent? Well, algorithms don't show intent. They just reinforce and reflect existing inequalities, right, based on the data that they're looking at. So how should we be thinking about this problem going forward, not only in criminal justice and policing, but also in other realms? So I, I think that's, that's one of the sort of juiciest questions to a group like this. Um, uh, it's, it's one of the hardest nuts to crack. The two things, I'm gonna be conversationally anal retentive in the sense that I'm gonna outline my answer and then I'm gonna give you my answer. Um, but it's, only, it's, it's not a long list, it's just it's really two things. Um, one is there's a kind of process expertise that needs to be democratized. Um, and the, the other is that there needs to be an explicit values piece that goes in in advance of any analytic or data collection strategy. But that's always a political question. The values question is always a political question. We're never gonna necessarily agree on values. But even if I, I agree with you on that point, well, that, that's, that's, I think that, that's fair, um, that we'll never agree on all values, but there's some values that are core, like there's some that are easily sold, right? Um, and they're sold and not sold out, in the sense of fairness is a value that is hard to argue against, though people manage all the time and make a ton of money doing it. Um, it at least in principle, it's hard to argue against, and I think that you can create momentum for those kinds of values being put in where they're not a part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. So let me give you a couple of examples of the, um, the process expertise that I think is necessary. Um, people here do sort of genetic coding type stuff, right? We heard from Alondra earlier. Um, <clears throat> if you code for um, things like uh, poverty and violence, it turns out that the alleles associated with being African American, they predict violence. Does that mean that black people are genetically predisposed to violence? No, that's the correlation fallacy. It's literally the example of the correlation fallacy. It is not that. It is that, you know, if you look at the zip code and you hold that constant, turns out that the allele predictiveness goes the heck away. But you gotta understand what that is, because what I just said was a scary thing to folks in here who are not geneticists and don't know the correlation fallacy and how it relates to that. Because it sounds a lot like I just said, genes predict violent behavior. It's just a correlation, which of course we would expect it to, the, our genes are, they're in us and they go where we go, and so your zip code is more predictive than your genetic code. Right? But if you don't know that, then you end up with what is going on and has been going on in the UK in terms of people using the correlation fallacy to produce public policy that subjugates black folks. Okay? That's the kind of process expertise that I'm talking about. You need to understand how it's working, otherwise it will work against you. The second part, which is that you need to have the values explicit, um, I, I wrote about before that, that uh, Target knows when you and your partner get pregnant, right? Um, and Google knows when you're looking, uh, when you just broke up because you start looking at your exes on Facebook and stuff. <laughs> like, they know these things. Um, uh, so I have friends at Google who told me that, like, don't go ahead because it'll, it'll show up on my screen and I'll feel sad for you. Um, <clears throat> so they know those sets of things. I was like, cool, so what do you do to predict justice? And they cried a little bit. They're like, what? Well, that's, nobody is asking me to ask that. I said, well, who are your bosses that no one wants you? Because I want to know how to predict justice, 
right? Those are my values. I want to know how to predict fairness. It's not like we couldn't do that. It's not like we can't imagine data captures that would speak to that or analytic strategies that would prioritize that. But that is no one's priority who's been in a position to say, this must be what goes with the set of contracts that we have when we do our predictive policing, when we start putting out our body cameras. So when we talk about having values as, as sort of a privileged affirmative priority to the process, data answers questions if you analyze it right. But if you don't have the right question, every answer is gonna feel wrong. That was a little Ani DeFranco for those of you who are just thinking about where I'm quoting from, but that's, that's the reality of it, right? Um, I won't sing the line for you, but you're, it's in your head for those of you who got it. Um, and that's what we have, I think, a lot, with a lot of our societal level data analytics is we've got powerful institutions and people who have a different set of questions and, and priorities than the people who the policies impact. And the people who the policies impact have neither the process expertise nor the capacity structurally in, in terms of power to give back the values-based questions that, the, that the, the data analytics must be required to ask. Okay, that seems like a pretty naughty problem because one way to interpret what you just said was it should be the expectation of citizens to know to fix to to learn from somewhere the analytic strategies and to engage in the process of doing this analysis. How the hell is that supposed to happen? Yeah, and so and like, who and who, and is there a? I mean, there are people with expertise that are in this room, for instance. I don't know if I would feel comfortable with random people giving random people access to lots of data because I'm feeling democratic, right? Even though it's a value, I'm not sure I'd feel comfortable handing over large swaths of data to people that don't have the training or the expertise or can know how to write formulas and algorithms. One of the great privileges of being a, a, an academic is to be able to think of long-term solutions that are idealistic and entirely impractical for short-term <laughs> right, uh, gains. Um, but let's do uh, just a quick thing if we can. I'm, I'm supposed to forget the audience is here. So to this empty room, can I see hands of people who work on coding and analytics as part of your job? You get paid for that in some way, shape, or form. Okay. Now, do you want people like me coming in trying to do your job? Yeah, hold on, hold on, hold on. No, that's not my question, though. My hand is, could you keep your hands back up if you're not white? All right, so, yeah. Woohoo. Party of seven people. Okay. Um, at a data and society conference, th and th this is absolutely th like the best kind of diversity I have ever seen, right? I, I don't know how many of you all get to be in rooms where, where coding and such is the topic, and you are not the only non white person, right? This is one of a handful of spaces. When I say a handful, I mean this is the only space that I've ever been in where that's not the case. So when I'm talking about democratizing, there is the long-term thing where I'm talking about broad, broad civics education, but there's also a specific thing. I need for groups of folks who are engaged in, in ground-level action to get that this is where the regulatory fight is going to be, and I need folks to come up who have an interest in this and have the privilege of education and the rest to go ahead and go in this direction. I see a bunch of bright stars in the, in the audience here, right? I mean, I'm, I'm looking at Sam, who's just sitting here just staring at me, right? A, a bright, shining, blazing star, right? About to take over the world doing this kind of stuff. And I need, I, I point my students and say, go be like him. But you're not going to be tall like that. And I don't think you're going to have the suits in that way. But go be like him to do the coding and to think about data as a tool for resistance and a tool for revolution. That's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. Yeah, I, I said it. I'll say it again, okay. right? <clears throat> I won't say it again. No. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, so let me ask you this. Uh, I didn't mean for this to turn into an interview, but I'm Wait, very comfortable in this role, so. Uh, <laughs> I'm about to see, where's the MSNBC camera? <laughs> so, um, okay, so I wanna come back to the data you're collecting and ask you, at some point, could the data that you're collecting have predicted that South Carolina security officer cop abusing that black girl? No. And the reason is the data that or we're- Or any of the other yeah, they, they, incidences of harassment or use of force. And that's, that's a slightly different question. The second one is a slightly different question, and you know it. Um, 
No, in the sense that we don't have ideographic level data and we're not trying to get at that. We don't track officers. So this officer has a 2013 complaint um, for harassment of black students calling them in gangs and a 2014 class action complaint uh, with regards to racial harassment of students, right? So the data that we're collecting don't. The data that the police department collects do. So again, the question is, who's asking the questions of the data, and where is that priority? To your second question, we can't say that it's going to be this officer on this day, and we're not set up to do that. We're not trying to be set up to do that. But we can say in this region there will be a problem. Um, and so what I can say is that talking with uh, our, our colleagues at DOJ, we have predicted three of the last seven or eight um, uh, uh, locations wise, which was shocking to us. We just said, look, we've got state level data, and just so you know, here's a list of places where we think there's gonna be a big problem. Um, and three of those places, they came through for us in the sense that there, were, there was an incident after we said these are places where you're gonna wanna be uh, paying closer attention. So we can, on the aggregate, start to predict departments and jurisdictions that are gonna end up being problematic. We're not gonna be able to predict the day, the time, the season, the officer. Um, on that level, that's just that's, but but that technology and those data are available for people who want to ask that questions. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I'm fairly well convinced that most departments capture enough data on individual officers that it can be done internally, provided that they've got a decent. I shouldn't say most departments. Most departments of a of a decent size can do it with the stuff they've got on hand. So the implications then of what you just said is that de at the department level, the use of data and technology can be used to radically change unfair and unjust policing practices. That's the promise. Yeah, no, that's, that's the, the prospect, right? Okay. That's the, when you say promise, I, I, I'm thinking of that swearing that it's going to happen, but that is the, the potential of, of the place. That absolutely can be the place. The issue has been that we don't require that of our analytics. It's not that we don't require it of the data, we don't require it of the analytics. Hmm. That's the values piece, right? There are, right now, I don't believe there's any chief in America that believes that she or he is going to lose their job because they have not asked the right questions of their data for their officers. So, I, I mean, I was about to say you can't be mad. You absolutely can be mad. I'm mad all the time about it. Um, but it's understandable that our analytic structures are not set up for that. And that it is the truly progressive folks, it's the true believers in law enforcement that have said, I want an early warning system that is a, a real early warning system for these civil rights kind of violations. These are folks who are not concerned about losing their jobs. These are folks who are concerned about losing sleep, right? And, and we can do better by ensuring that both classes of folks need to be concerned about this as a high priority. Okay, zoom, zooming out for a second, just from criminal justice. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, I want to come back to the regulatory gaps and where we should be thinking about regulation catching up to some of the challenges posed by data and technology. So zooming out just from criminal justice, I want to think more holistically about different, the entire system, right, in which people live. So this example that comes to mind is of um, data companies using micro-targeting and a whole range of background information and big data to actually predict and then market subprime mortgages to particular mm -hmm. individuals, communities. Um, so that's so housing, right, is one, let's say one area. I've mentioned employment a number of times, the use of data to predict um, if someone's suited for a particular job, by the way, including data on if you're likely to favor a union, for instance, which is a threat to most employers. And so you don't even get the interview, right? If, because we have data on that, which just might mean you're black, because black people happen to like unions more, which seems a little unfair to me. Um, all right, so employment, housing, and then we add in criminal justice. So are there common threads across those dimensions that we should worry about in terms of the use of data, and how should we be responding in terms of regulation, or how should we be thinking about responding? So one of the things that is coming up more and more as we, we have... keep it on... By the way, the other option is keep it on regulated, keep it on regulated yeah. right? And I, I, think, I think that's the core of the issue because something that's been coming up um, with a number of the folks in this room who've done way better and more work on this than I have is talking about 
um, how this invades privacy in certain kinds of ways and needs to be regulated for exactly, I go back to the values question. Right, so how is it okay that Target knows when me and my partner are pregnant? Like that's just creepy, right? Um, so can we regulate against creepy? Well, I think we can regulate against, well, we, we have lots of regulations against, against creepy, not enough in the academy, but we have them. Um, <clears throat> but we can regulate against creepy when we start thinking of, of our unique identifiers and our, our sort of micro statistics as a kind, a kind of personal uh, identity. And that's a way in which uh, <clears throat> I think we can be thinking about this with, from, a, from a policing perspective. I just saw the five minute sign, and since you, since you came back, there is a question I've been wanting to ask you that's related to this forever. You might say, you know, it's, it's not gonna be all that hard, but I think you know that, that what's coming, as we've talked about um, using data to target communities and how we think about this, and we talk about who's powerful and who's not powerful, I think in a law enforcement context, powerful people have money, they're white, they run institutions. Okay, um, but sometimes the powerful people are unions, and unions in a policing and a criminal justice context are all, almost always working class folks, right? Um, who are part of the sort of two tier between teachers unions and police unions. That's a big part of how labor gets to, to maintain its movement. So this is at once a progressive kind of thing and a not so progressive kind of thing. So please talk to me and talk, because nobody else is here, remember. Talk to me <laughs> about how we should be thinking about police unions in the, in the context of a broader labor struggle, labor movement, and working class folks struggling for more power, more, more equity inequality. There's nobody else in the room. Nobody else is in the okay. room. Actually, you can help me understand this. So, so I think one way to think about police unions is, it's a big question in my mind, actually, how much voice do they have on the job? How much, how much are police officers, and so I'm, I'm ignorant to policing structures, how much are police departments like the military versus slightly more democratic in terms of giving rank and file workers and union members in this case, a voice on the job? How much say do police officers actually have in the policing practices? Or is it just an edict that's handed down, we're gonna be using this technology, we're gonna use CompSet or whatever it is, we're gonna be doing this, and they have to just go out and execute. So that's one question for me. And then the second one that's tied to that is, most police unions that I've seen, particularly in big cities, um, frankly have almost all white leadership. And I often wonder in the context of black and brown people being harassed, killed by the police, um, where are the black and Latino officers? And how much voice do they have? So for me, it comes back to, vo and this is a values question, it comes back to voice, and that's, in my head, one of the roles of unions at the workplace and in society is to provide voice for people that often don't have voice at the workplace. How much voice do officers have at the workplace? And is that, is that one of the roles unions should play? Now, on the other side of it, yes, are there, within the union contract, within collective bargaining agreements between police departments and a police union, are there a range of protections for officers and workers um, that might rub up against the protections for citizens and residents? Absolutely. And how do we talk about that, right? So how do we talk about one when, those, when there's a conflict between the protections of officers as employees versus protections for civilians? And then you have to, I think, trade that off around the question of workplace voice more broadly. So I don't have a good sense of how much workplace voice rank and file officers have. And so to provide both an answer and then to redouble down on my question on that, um, <clears throat> So I, it, um, law enforcement in, in the United States is paramilitary, right? So it is um, policies or edicts from on high that are gone all the way uh, down through. The two points, uh, sort of broadly speaking, of police voice or, or of officer voice in police policy are um, activity. So I can be told to go over here, but that doesn't mean that I need to be arresting people um, unless there is real accountability for specific behaviors, right? Um, so what we saw in New York um, with basically d aggressive de-policing is one area of voice. And you, it doesn't have to be so severe as a 95% drop in activity, right? It can, it can be you know, work slowdowns uh, as opposed to work stoppages. The other place is at the point of collective bargaining, right? And there, I think you've hit on something that's really important because most um, 
uh, major city department unions are voted on. It's majority uh, membership. So you have these affinity groups, like you'll have the Blue Guardians, which is a black organization. You'll have Noble or the Black Peace Officers Association or, or what have you, or the Women's Officers Association, which is its own problematic, difficult thing um, uh, around. I wish we could have more time to get into it. But those don't have bargaining power. There's only one place that's allowed to have collective bargaining, that's the broad union, and the union, because it is a majority group, and law enforcement is sort of over white um, in terms of representation, you do end up having very few um, black and brown uh, union leaders. Um, so collective bargaining is that place for voice, but to say that unions are representative of the labor force is probably a difficult thing to try and say. And that's frankly a legal problem because of just the way our labor, without going into it, the way our labor laws are written, most unions have a duty of fair representation to, rec to bargain for everybody in a bargaining unit. So even if you opt out and you have a difference of opinion, the, what's in the contract still stands. So that's, that's, a legal, that's a legal question that also has to be taken on in this broader conversation. Not to, sorry to get into the weeds about Police unions. You asked the question, though. I did ask the question. It's an important question. Go ahead. Uh, 